The next speaker is someone I know well. I've known him all his life. And uh, I'm uh, very pleased to be able to tell you what's going on in MEF. And this is a, sort of a, a major overview of what we're doing to enable the provision and automation of new services in a dynamic, and agile, and orchestrated fashion. And it's all under this uh, umbrella framework that we call MEF 3.0. So if you look at the changes that the digital economy, the so-called digital economy, is, is bringing to the telecom market in particular, we had uh, uh, the Vertical Systems Group do a, a study last fall on what are your top challenges, and the top business drivers and the top deployment challenges. And these are what came out on the very top of those. The main, overwhelmingly main business driver is faster service provisioning. Create new services, get new revenue up and running soon, tailor it to some customer need. Um, and get it out there. Now, the deployment challenge has to do with, well, I have a certain footprint, but many of my customers have global reach and want global reach. So how do I deploy some service across a network of multiple providers over a geographic expanse? And in general, the, the operators want to take advantage of some of these new technologies, many of them, but how do they do that quickly and with minimal risk? And that's uh, really what we're trying to help them to do. So our mission is really to accelerate the worldwide adoption of what we call assured services across automated networks. Now, Francisco Javier talked about uh, being able to automate these things and the abstractions and the information models allow the automation of these components. We're looking at the entire automation of services, um, which means from a customer to an operator and from one operator to the next operator in a sequence of geographical extents. And so we've been doing this um, in one way or another for, for quite some time, but we've recently moved into much more of a framework for automation and orchestration and concatenation of services. The way we do this is to um, start with a set of principles by which we in MEF operate. The primary one is we measure ourselves by the size of the market that we foster. So commercial value has to be of immediate grasp. It's not like, well, someday in the future, this will all become viable. Uh-uh. Let's start with what we have now, and let's try to capitalize on the current investment, and that's the brownfield point, um, and get some commercial success starting now, moving to these ideal future scenarios, but not waiting forever to get there. We're trying to foster the easiest adoption of these new exciting technologies that I've mentioned here, SDN and NFV, cloud disaggregation, open source, and I've even put 5G in this list because it's turning into a catalyst for the adoption of these new technologies. And I think Vanessa will talk about that in the next talk. We in MEF don't have any religion about the implementation choices, sort of in a sense of uh, what uh, Francisco just explained. Uh, with the model, you can abstract the technology choices, and we have our own models. We work actually with them on models and our own abstraction interfaces, which allow you to hide the details of some particular part of the uh, implementation stack so that you can make whatever choice you want. And we know that the operator community is interested in open source, but it's not easily digestible, so they need some things that are just open and also proprietary support. And we don't care what that is. We want them to choose what makes sense for them in this part of their network now. We know they have big investments in their current networks, and so we assume that they're going to have those. We're not going to say, throw away all your old stuff and start with something new. That does not work. And we believe that a healthy ecosystem can arise from a level playing field where the operators, even as they morph, and the vendors as they morph, and the system integrators, take on increasingly effective roles in bringing solutions to the market. And let's not forget the enterprise customers that are going to be paying for a lot of this. So our membership is uh, continuing to grow. We're over 200 companies, and certainly over well over half of those are communication service providers, nearly all of the major ones you have heard of, uh, in really every region. I mean, we've got one in... You know, South Africa, Sub-Saharan, Central Africa, uh, small countries in Southeast Asia, and then the big countries as well. 
So it's truly a global forum because this is a global phenomenon and a global marketplace. So MEF started with carrier Ethernet back when Ethernet was considered a pretty unreliable datacom technology not suited for carrier applications. We created a services definition and certification for carrier Ethernet across metropolitan regions, which is how we started out with the official name of the Metro Ethernet Forum. That was legally changed four years ago. It's now just the MEF Forum. But the carrier Ethernet market it continues to grow, but it's been a... Uh, it's been a static service, and so um, e even though you can see how widely accepted it is globally, we thought we need to help make it automated and orchestrated and more on, on demand and interconnected with operators. And so that's why we have uh, really expanded our scope to the uh, whole concept of MEF 3.0. We had Carrier Ethernet 1.0, which is quite a specific service, then Carrier Ethernet 2.0, which connected operators. The evolution of that is, is MEF 3.0, and for the specific case of Carrier Ethernet, MEF 3.0 CE. So this is a framework that allows you to create agile and automated and assured services for not only Carrier Ethernet, but services at every layer of the architecture. So there are four pillars, or four pieces of the pie here, the services, the LSO APIs, certification, and the community. And everything we do falls into one of these categories or not. And I'll talk just a little bit about all of these. But in the case of services, more services, but they need to be agile and assured. And you can see that a number of them listed here, and these are really just the beginnings. The LSO APIs are essential for the abstraction of parts of the network and the uh, making of the services to be technology agnostic. Uh, the uh, certification which we've had for products and services is uh, moving into the cloud and becoming more automated. And then we've expanded our community. We got out of our silo. Previously, we did everything we did and we relied on the IEEE for the definition of Ethernet technology. And that's kind of about it. You can see that our uh, domain of influence and being influenced um, has expanded considerably. So let's look at each of these a little bit briefly. So in the services, services are important because that's how the operators make money. So that's our foremost interest to enable the creation provision of new services. And we're showing here uh, a, couple, a couple of things. First of all, you can see the colorful stack there. Uh, optical transport is a layer one service, and we support that now. Carrier Ethernet, we've done for 17 years. Uh, layer 3 IP services for IP VPNs for enterprises. That's now part of our portfolio. And above that, SD-WAN as an overlay, security and security as a service, application services, and whatever as a service on the top. And some of these uh, uh, service areas have been sized by reputable analyst companies. You can see the size of these markets in their timetables. It all adds up to over 250 billion U.S. dollars per year for all these services. So how do you get there from here? Another thing to take away from this illustration is the way we've structured it. On the left, we have the customer, an enterprise customer with a portal. It can be certainly an automated. We have in the middle the, what we call the retail service provider. This is your local operator. And on the right, a wholesale operator. You want to go to some geography where your retail operator does not play. Um, you know, you pick your country. There's a country across the world. Your local provider isn't going to have a footprint. So they engage the services of a third-party wholesale operator. And then you can see a lot of the goals here are to reach the cloud providers, wherever they be, or data centers or other corporate locations. So... When we talk about LSO, that stands for Lifecycle Service Orchestration. And this has the, uh, uh, the provisions of having customer-facing uh, APIs and inter-carrier APIs and then cloud-facing provisions. Um, and this is the, uh, the important thing for many of the customers of the telecom operators to be able to have a framework with APIs that allows them to offer a particular service over a fairly generic infrastructure. 
you can see made of physical or virtual or containerized network functions, um, and including legacy equipment, so long as we get the industry to adopt a certain number of primitive APIs, which I will discuss. So we have defined seven APIs. Four of them are east-west, which go inter-operator or between the customer and the operator. Three of them are north-south, which are within a single operator domain and allow the technology agnostic provision of services and orchestration. So you can see going from left to right, from the customer, there's Cantata and Allegro. Further to the right, between the carriers, the equivalents are called Sonata and Interlude. And then the north-south ones in, in red, I think that's red, are legato, presto, and adagio. Now these are all musical terms, but I will tell you now that they do not carry over any meaning of what they might mean in a musical context. My wife is a professional musician, and I was talking to her about these, trying to explain what I do for a living. She said, oh, so the presto interface is really fast. I said, no, it has nothing to do with the musical meaning of presto. We kind of chose these out of the air. But with an orchestration, You've got a conductor, you have an orchestra, and so then we use musical terms. So, but what's important here is that the abstractions we've defined, the business applications, the service orchestrations, and the technology domains, and particularly the infrastructure control and management in the technology domains, are important and well-chosen abstractions. Business applications, we call them that, but they can incorporate the OSS and BSS, but we don't want to call them that anymore because those are being disaggregated, deconstructed, and reconstructed. Service orchestration function, this is an abstract notion, and it could be implemented with OSM. It could be implemented with parts of ONAP. It could be implemented with something proprietary. In fact, it has been in all three cases. Then in the technology domain, an infrastructure controller can accept, you know, presto from the service orchestration function. And the orchestration function doesn't have to know whether it's an SDN or an SD-WAN, a proprietary legacy technology, doesn't matter. That's what translates it. And then Adagio we have not fleshed out, and I'll show you, we've, we're working on all of these to a greater or lesser degree to make them actually real and to find them. So we have a roadmap for the APIs as we actually develop, and these are important artifacts of what we produce. These are some of our most important deliverables. Well, we have some core framework ones, and that includes the reference architecture, which was sort of illustrated there, our processes, but more importantly, on the, on the right, on that top line, we have the core model and our information modeling guidelines and a common service model. And for these things, we work closely with a number of other organizations I will show a bit later. But it's really important to get this core correct because then it's extensible for whatever we want to define after that. You look at these below, the cantata uh, from the customer and Allegro, um, essentially parallel to Sonata and Interlude, and you can see a lot of detail in Sonata and a lot of detail in Presto. The market has demanded we flesh these out first. Sonata is an east-west API that allows two operators to set up a service between them for the benefit of a customer. And basically it has to do with, can I reach this destination? Is this service available in your catalog? Can you give me a quote for it? Can I order it? How do I pay for it? Can I pay for it? And are there troubles with it? The interlude slightly below that is more a real-time operation of some kind of a service. And similarly with, with Cantata. So how do I monitor what's going on, make sure it's up and running? Generally, nothing that has to do with what I'm paying for it. If that comes into play, then we have to go upward, um, essentially through Legato to say there's a change here. Uh, it's going to affect the service and what you're paying. Presto then goes down from the surface orchestrator to the infrastructure. And that's where we set up the requirements for how you actually uh, arrange to connect and service uh, some customers. So. You can see where there is a timetable for these, and I'll show you sort of what goes into releasing uh, these as our important specifications. So we define services, but we also define these APIs. 
Now, it used to be that all we did was standards, and we'd publish PDFs and documents. It's hard to run a PDF. So we have a standard, MEF 55, the LSO framework. It's a specification, and it's easy to read, and it depicts all these things very clearly. But that's not all we do is publish the specs for the APIs. We also release them as software development kits. These are open source toolkits um, that allow you to do a trial implementation, try it out, see what works, feed the results back to the specification of the API and its formal definitions. So we have very formal definitions of the uh, in pros, in the information models, and the data models which are running code. But then we have the, uh, the SDKs, and we do POCs with these, and we've had some hackathons. And we try to actually do this in a, a six-month cycle with a, you know, a agile sprint and, and release dates um, and keep this whole thing current. So we're doing uh, really a DevOps approach to standards and software, and that'll be the topic of my keynote on Wednesday morning. So this is a, a change, and when you talk about digital transformation and you're changing processes, um, this is a transformation that we and MEF undergo ourselves, as well as expecting the operators and their enterprise customers to go through it. So this is a whole new way of, of doing business, but given that most of these are implemented in software now and not in chips, you can afford to iterate and work on it you know, with real uh, running code before you finalize a specification. I mentioned that certification uh, has become more agile also. We certify services and we certify technologies. And this allows an operator to say, I'm offering a certified carrier Ethernet or at some point SD-WAN service, these characteristics. Another operator knows exactly what that means and their enterprise customers know what that means and they can do some comparison shopping. For the technology community, they can get certified that their products support this particular service or in this way. That creates a level playing field that compete based on price and performance and features and not on the basis of lock-in. We also certify professional skills. In our ProCert program, we've done this for Carrier Ethernet for a long time, six, 7,000 people certified Carrier Ethernet professionals. We have now added sort of a layer below that in, in what we call network foundations, uh, which is a broader scope of understanding networking than just carrier Ethernet. And we've just added NFV and SDN certification uh, in conjunction with our friends at Etsy, NFV, ISG, and others in the SDN experts world. We'll be adding some things to this uh, professional level, and then as you agglomerate a certain number of these, uh, we'll have elevated expert level certifications that show that you're really qualified in a number of these areas. So there are really two advantages to a program like this. One is that uh, it, offers, it offers employers of these skilled professionals an opportunity to upgrade their, the skill base of their current employees because hiring new employees is difficult and expensive. Uh, you can identify certain costs to land a new employee. It's quite high. Better to retrain your current employees so they stay with you, but they have the skills that you need. From the individual's side, being up upgrading your skills and getting certified for that makes you more competitive. It keeps you up to date in your field, and it makes you an attractive candidate to your current employer or to other employers. MEF handles what it means to be certified. We don't do training. We accredit training providers if they wish that. It doesn't have to be. Um, uh, so that's an open market, uh, but we strictly control the test and certification so it maintains a high quality and a high level of reputation. Our community stakeholders are quite broad now. We have a developer community that works uh, on the SDKs and the open source artifacts. Um, we do a lot of collaboration. I'll show a slide on that. Our, our, our members are more involved. And what's interesting is that different populations within a member company are now getting involved in the MEF projects. Used to be those who just did sort of global standards. Now we have people that are closer to implementations and in the CTU office doing proofs of concept um, and more hands-on in terms of implementation than before. 
We have formed an enterprise advisory council, you know, about 10 companies of, you know, major global reputation. We have one represented in the room. And they give us feedback on what we're doing. They are the ultimate customers, so we need to hear from them. And the POCs, uh, these we've been demonstrating every year at our f annual fall conference, I'll mention. Um, it's coming up in uh, November in Los Angeles, and we had 20 last year. We capped it at that. These were really the highlight of the show, and stuff you really wouldn't expect to see. Okay, we got some of the MEF 3.0 concepts, but suddenly we've got four operators setting up a service, operating it, doing settlement using blockchain, and taking it down and getting paid. These are some of the other organizations with whom we now collaborate, open source projects, standards organizations, and some that are increasingly hard to label. So you can see there's just a, a range of sort of the traditional ones, um, like the IETF and the ITU, to close relationship with the TM Forum on the LSO APIs. They essentially give us the generic APIs, and we fill out the payloads, and we do extensions, so they apply to specific service instances and specific API um, attributes that need to be conveyed from one party to another. A lot with the Linux Foundation, well, we've got Presto into Open Daylight, we've got interfaces coming into ONAP, uh, our members contributing use cases to ONAP, as well as OPNFV. Uh, Panda, the platform for network data analytics, is really a foundation for our analytics project. Um, this really gives us a head start, and of course, that's the uh, uh, OSM, and, and with the Etsy NFV community as for our certification, because we know those people well. Uh, we're also um, trying to get some help from the uh, uh, Open Compute Project. I know that someone will be here uh, this week from that. Um, among other things, the universal CPE. How can the telcos go to an aggregated data uh, center model when they use SDN and NFV to get away from proprietary appliances put their software in some place, run it as a little data center, and build on a white box. How, how do you, what's an effective way of doing that, and how do they understand what those things should look like? We get some of that advice from the Open Compute Project. And of course, you might expect TIP, the Telecom Info Project. Um, how can the APIs be of use to them out in the infrastructure to lower the costs of their, uh, essentially, the radio and backhaul infrastructure? And of course, 5G with 3GPP. This is turning into something that we actually enjoy helping with because we don't have to get involved in any of the radio aspects, any of this new stuff within kind of a single 5G domain, but boy, they sure need a lot more fiber, a lot more Ethernet backhaul for the denser service and the higher speeds that they're putting uh, as a result of 5G. So MEF 19, as our public conference will be called this year, will be held in Los Angeles. Um, with a member meeting, but the public conference is 18 to 22, Monday to Wednesday in November. This is a big conference. You know, it's as big as uh, you know, the you know, flagship layer one, two, three conference, over a thousand uh, people come, hundreds of organizations from company, countries all over the world. And we have the usual format of keynotes, panels, discussions, tutorials, workshops, and we have a, a big expo with the POCs. Um, and that's for me the exciting part to see what what these folks have come up with. And every POC involves at least three companies. So it's not just a product showcase for one company. That's what makes them interesting. It's all open to the public. You don't have to be a member. So we invite anybody here to attend that or to participate in a POC for which you also do not have to be a member. So this is what we're ov overall about, the creation of new revenue-producing services in an agile fashion, incorporating the latest technology of, of SDN, NFE, cloud uh, orchestration, open source, and 5G. We want to see a bright new world of telecom services and customers and suppliers. We know it's changing. We want it to change in a way that enables companies to get there from here if they want to. There will be changes. Some are painful, as with any disruption of this magnitude in the industry. But we think it is possible. We think the abstractions, the information models, and the APIs that we have created in conjunction with others in the industry are an important step toward this modernization of networking and telecoms. 
May I answer any questions? Yes. Uh, can you explain how you're collaborating with the PM Forum uh, and which type of APIs? Because as we see, like we have a box like orchestration, and on the IT side, we are leveraging advantages from like the uh, PM Forum a network as a service cloud suit and directly integrating. So, so how you see a map? Will it be some layer in between, or you will be hardening the APIs from PM Forum? So it's not really a layer in between. We take their their basic APIs and we fill out the payloads for specific services and specific use cases. And even if you look at, you know, Sonata, we've got Sonata for, you know, a given Sonata may not be just for a single service. You may have multiple instances for different services you want to enable because the attributes you share over that might be different. So we take the basic APIs from the TM form and we work a lot with them. Um, uh, and we essentially fill them out. We put in specific service. Here, this is to, to start a service. Well, we say what service it is you're starting. Because they, they don't do that. They're, they're, they're generic and apply widely, but they have to be specified. Some cases we make extensions to those for specific needs that we make. They can take those extensions and see whether they want to make it part of a future basic template of, a, of an API. So it's, it's a two-way street with the TM Foreman, and we work very closely with them.